discussion today focuses first and foremost upon Leviticus chapter 26. But as we shall see, it focuses on a great deal more than only Leviticus chapter 26 because the subject matter that will be the focus of our attention necessarily engages many passages, especially in the Torah and more generally throughout the words of the prophets in the Bible as well. So while we certainly don't aspire to an exhaustive discussion, which would take much more time than we have at our disposal, at the very least, let's get a sense of what God's message to us is, beginning in Leviticus 26, and consider how this plays itself out in the passages ahead. On that note, beginning with Leviticus chapter 26, verse 3. The portrayal starts with the promise of reward, if we are worthy of such reward. If you walk in my statutes, in verse 3, and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give your rains in their season, and the land will yield her produce, and the trees of the field will yield their fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing pine, and you shall eat your bread until you have enough, and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land, and you will lie down, and none shall make you afraid, and I will cause evil beasts to cease out of the land. Neither shall the sword pass through your land. Now, of course, manifestly, these rewards are really all material blessings. But note the recurrent theme throughout. The land will yield to produce. You will dwell in your land safely. I will give peace in the land. Cause evil beasts to cease out of the land. Neither shall the sword pass through your land. The material blessings are all of them intertwined with the land. And when we continue in verse 9, the blessings aren't even merely material. I will turn toward you, make you fruitful and multiply you, but not only that, establish my covenant with you. There is still more on a material plane, you'll eat old store long kept, and you'll bring forth the old from before the note. Spiritually, I will set my tabernacle or my dwelling among you. My soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. I am God, your Lord, who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you go upright. Again, the blessing, the reward. And then, in the very next verse, the other side of this coin. Verse 14, if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and the long litany of punishments, we're not going to go through the entire list. First of all, we lack the time. Second of all, to merely read through such devastating punishments would perhaps shock, but may not in itself edify, unless we really consider them at much, much greater length. But I do want to stress, beginning in verse 16, I will appoint terror over you, even consumption and fever, that shall make the eyes to fail and the soul to languish. 
You will sow your seed in vain, and enemies will eat it. Skipping to verse 19, I will break the pride of your strength, and will make your heaven as iron, and your earth, your land, as brass. And your power will be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield her produce, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. The land is the platform for blessing and also for the opposite, for the devastating, terrible, awesome curse, the threat of punishment. And skipping, what continues here is, moreover, a message of the enemy. In verse 25, I will bring a sword upon you that shall execute the vengeance of the covenant. You will be gathered together within your cities. I will send pestilence among you, and you will be delivered into the hand of the enemy and the devastating consequences of siege. I will break your staff of bread. Ten women will break your, bake your bread in one oven, and they will deliver your bread again by weight. You will eat but not be satisfied. Verse 29, you will eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall you eat. Verse 31, and I will make your cities a waste, and will bring your sanctuaries into desolation, and will not smell the savor of the sweet odors of your sacrifices. Verse 32, again, the land. I will bring the land into desolation. And your enemies that dwell there will be astonished at it. Land. That is merely the start of it. All of its horrific devastation. The worst, ironically, is still ahead. And this is a point that it's critical for us to appreciate because verse 33 introduces an additional dimension. And you will I scatter among the nations, and I will draw out the sword after you, and your land will be a desolation, a desolation because you'll be scattered. You won't be there anymore. You'll be in exile. Your cities will be a waste. Verse 36, and as for them that are left of you, I will send the faintness into their heart, into the lands of their enemies, and the sound of a driven leaf will chase them, and they will flee as one flees from the sword, and they shall fall when None pursues. No one's even chasing them anymore. Likewise, in verse 37, they will stumble one upon another, as it were, before the sword. But it's not before the sword. No one is pursuing. And you will have no power to stand before your enemies. And you will be lost among the nations. That's a more literal translation. It'll be lost. The land of your enemies will eat you up. Disappear. You lose your identity. Until. Ultimately. After these horrific descriptions in verse 40. And they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers in their treachery which they committed against me and also that they have walked contrary to me. They confess their sins. God gives us always the opportunity to return to him. The opportunity to return to him automatically becomes, of course, a responsibility to return to him. And when we do that, in verse 42, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember and I will remember the land. 
in verse 44, and yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am God their Lord. Verse 45, but I will for their sakes. Remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. So naturally, we can summarize. This is a story of reward and punishment. Exile and restoration. But there's a significant theme that upon reflection is vividly obvious here that should give us pause. And that is while the state of exile is obviously not pleasant, still and all, what was taking place prior to exile in the land was incalculably worse. That is, remember, when we are in the land, the sword will execute the vengeance of the covenant, will have no food to eat, and even eat the flesh of sons and daughters. What devastation in exile, there are no such curses. In fact, if anything, on the contrary, you note know that while the description here is of fleeing in both verse 36 and verse 37, fleeing, but there's no one chasing. So again, exile is certainly not pleasant. And there is a keen sense. We have not found, we will not find our place in exile. But it's not because the devastation that was described when we were still here in the land continues there, ironically isn't it? Perhaps a bit like if we can describe it by way of allegory. Parents have a grown child who is continuously not just disobedient but rebellious and behaving destructively in their home and the parents withhold privileges, and the parents punish, and the parents chastise, and the parents rebuke, and nothing helps. And eventually, the parents say to the child, you need to get out of here. This is not your home anymore. And the child leaves, and at first brush, it looks like everything has become an awful lot more relaxed.
that you confess your iniquity, that you recognize what has become of you. You've become a homeless vagabond, banished from your loving father's table. Finally, you ready yourself to become worthy of the gift of restoration. And your loving father is able to bring you back home. That sequence, reward, punishment, exile, restoration, is one that repeats itself again and again. Indeed, we should note that Leviticus chapter 26 is not the first passage in the Torah and the five books of Moses that threatens exile. We read of the threat of exile already in Leviticus chapter 18 and again in chapter 20. That is, the same crimes that resulted in the land vomiting out its former inhabitants because of their crimes, because of their abominations, could lead the land to vomit you out as well. That's essentially the concluding message in this passage, in the next last chapter of Leviticus, God's covenant at Sinai. And in much the same vein, but with even greater and more frightening elaboration, we see the same sequence described beginning in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Starting in verse 1, and it shall come to pass, if you hearken diligently unto the voice of God your Lord to observe to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, then God your Lord will set you on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you hearken unto the voice of God your Lord. And there's a long list of the blessings. Blessed you will be in the city. Blessed you will be in the field. Verse 6, blessed you will be when you come in, blessed you will be when you go out. In verse 8, God will command a blessing with you in your barns, your granaries, in all that you put your hand into. He will bless you in the land that God your Lord gives you. Spiritually, in verse 9, God will establish you for a holy people unto himself as he has sworn to you, if you do what you're supposed to be doing. And once again, the land. In verse 11, God will make you overabundant for good in the fruit of your body, the fruit of your cattle, the fruit of your land. In the land that God swore unto your fathers to give you. And likewise, in verse 12, God will open unto you his good treasure of the heaven to give the rain of your land in the season, to bless all the work of your hand. Verse 13, God will make you the head, not the tail. You will be above only and not be beneath if you hearken unto the commandments of God your Lord that I command you this day to observe and to do them. And once again, beginning in verse 15, the other side of this coin. It will come to pass, if you will not hearken unto the voice of God your Lord, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all the curses will come upon you and overtake you. 
and paralleling precisely what we saw in the blessings. Cursed you will be in the city. Cursed you will be in the field. Verse 19, cursed you will be when you come in. Cursed you will be when you go out. In verse 20, God will send upon you cursing, discomfiture, rebuke, and all that you put your hand on to, to do until you are destroyed, until you are lost quickly because of the evil of your doings whereby you put so Verse 21, again, the theme of the land. God will make the pestilence cleave unto you until he has consumed you from off the land whither you come to possess it. In verse 23, again, the land, the heaven that is over your head will be brass, and the earth, the land under you, will be iron. God will make the rain of your land powder and dust from heaven will come down upon you until you are destroyed. And your carcasses will be food unto all the fowls of the air and unto all the beasts of the land. And there will be none to frighten them away. And the curses, admittedly, become all the more detailed and horrific. That include, in verse 32, your sons and daughters being taken away from you. Verse 33, all the fruit of your land and your labors being carried away. In verse 34, you will be mad to the sight of your eyes, which you see. Horrific diseases, all of the produce of your land being destroyed, your children going into captivity. Verse 45, all these curses will come upon you and pursue you and overtake you till you are destroyed. Because you did not hearken unto the voice of God your Lord, to keep his commandments and the statutes which he commanded you. And once again, beginning in verse 48, the enemy. Therefore you shall serve your enemy, whom God will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness, in want of all things. And he will put a yoke of iron upon your neck until he has destroyed you. He will bring, God will bring against you from afar, from the end of the earth, a nation as the vulture swoops down, a nation whose tongue you don't understand, a nation of fierce countenance who neither favors the old nor graces the young, and you shall eat the fruit of your cattle, the fruit of your land, ground, until you are destroyed. In verse 52, again, as we saw in Leviticus chapter 26, the siege. He will besiege you in all of your gates until your high and fortified walls come down where you can trust throughout all your land. And he will besiege you in all your gates throughout all your land which God has given you. And again, you will eat the fruit of your own body, flesh of your sons and daughters in siege and straightness wherein your enemies straighten you, afflict you. In verse 61, every sickness and every plague which is not written in this book of the Torah, them will God bring upon you until you are destroyed. And you will be left few in number. From off the land, whither you came in to possess it. And God will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. 
and there you will serve other gods which you had not known, neither you nor your fathers. You will be subordinate to an alien pagan culture. And once again, as we saw in Leviticus chapter 26, exile is not going to be pleasant. And maybe that in itself is a critically important gift. Because after all, punishment is always intended for the good to rehabilitate. And if you will be able to delude yourself into thinking that exile is home, you'll never grow. You'll never learn from your mistakes. So you will never be able to think that exile is home because ultimately, in the long run, among these nations, you shall have no repose, no calm. There will be no rest for the sole of your foot, but God will give you there a trembling heart and failing eyes and languishing soul. What we saw in Leviticus chapter 26. You will be fleeing even when no one is pursuing you. And in verse 66, your life will hang in doubt before you. You'll fear night and day and have no assurance of your life. In the morning, you'll be saying, would that it were evening. And in the evening, you will say, would that it were morning for the fear of your heart, which you will fear, and for the sight of your eyes, which you will see. You'll always feel hunted. You will never feel at home because you're not at home. Your home is in the palace of your loving father. That's here in his land, not there in exile. And the culmination in Deuteronomy chapter 28, although it's not the end of the story, the ultimate return to exile, God will bring you back into Egypt in ships by the way whereof I said to you, you will see it no more again. The archetype of exile, Egypt. And there you will sell yourselves unto your enemies for bondmen and bondwomen, slaves. But no one will buy you. Your lives will be deemed worthless. Again, reward, punishment, exile of the worst sort. I reiterate, Deuteronomy chapter 28 begins the sequence but doesn't end it. We need to continue into Deuteronomy chapter 29 and ultimately into Deuteronomy chapter 30. In chapter 29, the generation to come, your children will rise after you, the foreigner who comes from a foreign land. We read in verse 21, when they see the plagues of that land and the sickness where God had made it sick, the whole land is brimstone and salt and burning. All the nations will say, wherefore has God done this unto this land? And they'll all know. They'll all recognize because they forsook the covenant of God, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. Verse 26, Therefore the anger of God was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curse that is written in this book. And God rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. Again, exile. But immediately afterward, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, restoration. Beginning in chapter 30, verse 1. And it will come to pass when all these things are come upon you, all these things, the blessing and the curse, not one or the other. You've seen it all. The entire sequence of history, blessing and curse. 
which I have set before you. And you will consider it in your heart among all the nations where God, your Lord, has driven you. And you will return to God, your Lord, and hearken to his voice according to all that I command you this day, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. Pay attention to that motif of all your heart and all your soul because it's highlighted since we will see it repeatedly in this session. And once you return to God with all your heart and with all your soul, then God your Lord will turn your captivity and have compassion upon you and will return and gather you from all the peoples where God your Lord had scattered you. If any of you are dispersed in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there will God your Lord gather you, and from there he will fetch you. And God your Lord will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you will possess it. And he will do you good and multiply you above your fathers. Restoration. Restoration, return to the land. Restoration, return to him. In verse 6, remember the motif of all of your heart and all of your soul. God your Lord will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love God your Lord with all your heart and with all of your soul that you may live. Restoration. And once again, we know this is critical. It is, after all, one could say most essentially a spiritual restoration. Repentance. Repentance in Hebrew is the same word as return. You return to God. A spiritual return. But the spiritual return is inseparable from the geographical return. The return to the land. Just as the ultimate punishment was banishment from the land. The ultimate punishment was that we are banished from God's table, from his palace. The ultimate restoration is precisely a return there. Again, I reiterate, this is unquestionably a recurrent theme in the Bible. And to cite a couple of additional examples, in particular, a couple of additional examples from Deuteronomy, where we see the central focus upon the land even more explicitly. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 4, for example, there isn't even anything stated with respect to the punishment that we experience in the land. The emphasis is entirely the punishment of being lost from off the land. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 25, when you beget children and children's children and you shall have been long in the land and deal corruptly. Do that which is evil in the sight of God your Lord to provoke him. Verse 26, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly be lost from off the land where until you pass over the Jordan to possess it. You will not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. Destroyed meaning God will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where God will lead you away. Exile. It's all about punishment. And the punishment is exile and restoration. In verse 29, from thence, 
you will seek God your Lord and will find him who search after him. Remember the motif we saw before? With all your heart and with all your soul. They have to be real. They need to be sincere. In verse 30, in your distress, when all these things are come upon you in the end of days, you will return to God your Lord and hearken unto his voice. Almost precisely the same words that we see also in Deuteronomy chapter 30. For God your Lord is a merciful God. He will not fail you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers that he swore to them. And ultimately, it is all about recognizing that, recognizing the return to him and recognizing that returning to him is all about returning to the land. I'm skipping to verse 40. You will keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you to say, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, that you may prolong your days upon the land, which God, your Lord, gives you forever. And finally, one last illustration. There are so many more, but we're limiting ourselves. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Here, if anything, the stress upon the land is even more explicit and accentuated. Because beginning in verse 8, the whole emphasis is upon the land. You will keep all the commandment which I command you this day, that you may be strong, and come in and possess the land, whither you pass over to possess it. Verse 9, and that you may prolong your days upon the land that God swore unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed a land flowing with milk and honey. And this land is not merely there for material bounty. It is for the spiritual connection. Verse 12, a land that God your Lord cares for. The eyes of God your Lord are always upon it. And therefore, in verse 13, on the one hand, it will come to pass, if you hearken diligently unto my commandments that I command you this day, to love God your Lord and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give the rain of your land in its season, the former rain, the latter rain, that you may gather your corn, your wine, and your oil. All, on the one hand, the reward in the land. Verse 16, again, the other side of the coin. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside. And the consequence, verse 17, the anger of God be kindled against you and shut up the heavens so there will be no rain and the ground, the land, will not yield her fruit, give her produce, and you will be lost quickly from off the good land that God is giving you. Our recurrent motif. Therefore shall you lay up these words in your heart and in your soul. Ultimately, by way of conclusion, in verse 21, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children. Where? Upon the land that God swore unto your fathers to give them as the days of the heavens above the earth. So when we consider the thrust of these various passages, and admittedly we've at least taken general stock of not only Leviticus chapter 26, but Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapters 28, 29, and 30. On the one hand, it's all about being spiritually connected. It's all about our bond with God. But at the same time, we might say on the other hand, but maybe more properly, it's the same hand. The platform for that connection is the land. Again, 
God's palace. It all happens in the land. It is through the land that we connect with God's blessings and God forbid if we prove ourselves unworthy. And the ultimate punishment that separates us from that closeness to God that we sense when we are in his palace in the land is exile. And conversely, the return to God is always a return to the land. Now, it's important for us to stress an additional dimension here. And this is something that really emerges from what we already saw, especially in Leviticus chapter 26 and in Deuteronomy chapter 28, where the devastating punishments were happening in the land, in exile. In exile, things weren't pleasant, but the devastating punishments didn't apply because the ultimate punishment was being in exile. To appreciate that being in the land is its own blessing. It's not because we have any guarantee that everything is going to go well for us in the land. And I'd like to further accentuate this point with a couple of passages from the prophets. Both of the passages that I'd like to briefly consider are clearly speaking not of the era in which the prophets gave us these prophecies. If anything, they're speaking to us and to the future. They're speaking of a time beyond both the reward and the punishment, beyond exile, at the time of restoration. And it turns out that restoration doesn't mean everything all of a sudden becomes simple, easy, pleasant, even here in the land. In Ezekiel chapter 38, we read of God's words concerning and in a way addressed to Gog, the king of Magog. Where God says, I'm reading in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 4, I will turn you about or unbridle you and put hooks into your jaws and I will bring you forth and all your army, horses and horsemen. In verse 8, after many days, you will be mustered for service. In the latter years, you will come against the land. Note, the land that is brought back from the sword, that is gathered out of many peoples. This is after the restoration. Israel has returned home, has returned to the land. Against the mountains of Israel, which have been a continual waste, it is brought forth out of the people, and they dwell safely, all of them. They come home. And you will ascend. You will come like a storm. I feel compelled to note that the Hebrew for like a storm, ka shoah, like a shoah, a Hebrew word that I suspect everyone can recognize. You will be like a cloud to cover the land, you and all your bands and many peoples with you. In verse 11, you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will come upon them that are quiet, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. A peaceful land. Take spoil, take prey, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited. Take, come home. 
against the people who are gathered out of the nations that have gotten cattle and goods and dwell in the middle of the earth. Because that's the land. That's the land. The middle of the earth. The heart of the world. And the prophecy continues in verse 14. In that day when my people Israel dwell safely, they've come home. Shall you not know it? You shall come up against my people Israel. As a cloud to cover the land, it shall be in the end of days. I will bring you against my land. Note. God is bringing them against the land. You know, upon further reflection, we already saw that. That is, going back to verse 4, I will put hooks in your jaws and bring you forth. In verse 5, after many days you will be mustered for service. Does that mean no free will? So, of course, this is a subject that we have addressed elsewhere. What we'll merely note here is, no, certainly it's no violation of free will. Historically, I'm sure it is superfluous for me to point out that over the generations, there have been so many people who have competed, vied for the opportunity to be cast in the role of Gog to go to battle against God and God's people, Israel, in the land. So it's Gog's decision. And all of the hordes that go with him, he thinks he's going to do battle against God and God's plan. And the prophet tells us he's part of God's plan. He doesn't realize it, but he is. You will come against my people Israel. I will bring you against my land. You know why? That the nations may know me when I shall be sanctified through you, O Gog, before their eyes. In verse 18, it will come to pass in that day when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will arise up in my nostrils, for in my jealousy and the fierce wrath I have spoken surely in that day. There will be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And there is a vivid description of the cataclysm that shakes the land. In verse 21, I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, my mountains, my land says the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I went into judgment with him, with pestilence and with blood. And I will cause to rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing shower and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will make myself known in the eyes of many nations. And they will know that I am God. This is all part of the plan. But now, consider this. Sure, we see the resolution, the conclusion. But inevitably, this is happening in the land. They've already swooped into the land, wreaking havoc and devastation in the land the people who are in the land, who are back in the land to which they've been restored. We see this perhaps even more vividly in Zechariah chapter 14, which like Ezekiel chapter 38 is clearly speaking to the future. Beginning in verse 1, behold the day of God comes when your spoil will be divided in the midst of you. Verse 2, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken. The house is rightful, the women ravished. Half the city will go forth into exile. Terrible devastation here. 
in Jerusalem. And then, verse 3, Then shall God go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle, because it may appear to be a battle against Israel. It's really a battle against God. And his feet will stand on that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the mountain will itself split. Again, a description of cataclysm, as we saw in Ezekiel chapter 38 as well. And you will sleep to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach until Azel. You will flee like you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And God, my Lord, will come, and all the holy ones with you. God goes forth to do battle. All the holy ones. All those who lived and died in devotion to him. In verse 9, And God will be king over all the earth. In that day, God will be one and his name one. It's all intended to drive home that message. Now, granted, there is the material promise. In verse 10, all the land will be turned to be like a plain. And Jerusalem will be lifted up and inhabited in her place. In verse 11, and men will dwell therein, and there shall be no more extermination, but Jerusalem will dwell safely. So there is, ultimately, that promise of deliverance. But consider the devastation that goes before the land is no picnic, no free lunch. These prophecies are terrifying. If we're looking simply for material bounty, it doesn't look like this is the place to look. But if you're looking for the platform through which we bond to God, through which all of us bond to God, through which God is revealed in the world. Again, remember the message of the battle of Gog and Magog, that the nations may know me when I will be sanctified through you, O Gog, before their eyes. That's all part of the role of the land as manifesting God's presence. Now, of course, inevitably, when we consider in a kind of more global sense what we've learned from all of this, there are multiple messages, both messages that pertain to Israel and messages that pertain to us all, both Jews and non-Jews. First, with respect to the latter, the land is an opportunity and opportunity is responsibility. It's not just for Israel. We've had occasion to note in the past the thrust of chapter 17 in the second book of Kings. What happens after the exile of the ten tribes, when the king of Assyria brings people from various other nations and settles them in the land of Israel, and they have a problem. The problem, in a word, is lions. In verse 25, and so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not God. Therefore, God sent lions among them, which killed them. Note, they weren't set upon by lions in their native lands. And although, of course, you might propose that maybe lions don't live in their native lands, if God wanted to, I'm sure he could have come up with something. Rather, their being in the land imposed upon them, even though they weren't Israel, an additional responsibility. They recognize that this is because they don't know the manner of the God of the land. That in some sense, the Torah is the book of rules for palace behavior when you're in God's palace. And so the remedy is sending one of the priests of Israel who had been exiled back, and the priest dwells in Bethel, and teaches them how to fear God. And they make some kind of amalgam. They fear God, and they also serve their own gods. 
which was evidently sufficient at least for the lion. My point here simply is that even these heathen nations were held to a higher standard of conduct because they were in the palace of the king. The land of Israel is responsibility. It is responsibility for Israel. It is responsibility to everyone, Jew and non-Jew. But the additional dimension, of course, that we inevitably sense here, and this too, on the one hand, is a message that is particular for Israel, but I believe it has universal ramifications, is the nature of our bond with God. That is, on the one hand, of course, we should note that this is precisely what what was accentuated in Leviticus chapter 26. Remember, in verse 42, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham I will remember and the land I will remember. Verse 44, for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly, to break my covenant with them, for I am God their Lord. The covenant is irrevocable. And indeed, in much the same, in Samuel 1, chapter 12, verse 22, the prophet Samuel assures the people, God will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because God has sworn to make you a people unto himself. And likewise, when we consider God's promise in making his covenant with Abraham. In Genesis chapter 17, in verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your seed after you. And in verse 8, that everlasting covenant necessarily is a promise of the land. Again, bonding with God necessarily goes hand in hand with being in his palace, in his land. Verse 8, I will give unto you and to your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This is something constant. This is something from which we are exiled, but to which we will inevitably, ultimately, return. It cannot be otherwise. God swore. So, of course, one necessary consequence of what we have seen is appreciating this everlasting bond, the everlasting bond to God, the everlasting bond to the land. Simultaneously, it's important for us to appreciate, does this in any way guarantee having an easy time of it? We've already seen the answer very clearly. It does not. If anything, On the contrary, in Amos chapter 3, verse 2, the prophet, in God's name, speaks to the people of Israel, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth, that intimate bond. Therefore, I will visit upon you all your iniquities. Now, I submit to you that while this is addressed to Israel, it pertains to all of those who, from their devotion to God, make themselves worthy of being known, as it were, of all the families of the earth. It's not going to lead to a promise of easy times or even what to mere flesh and blood eyes 
will appear to be good times. I will visit upon you all your iniquities. On the one hand, we really do sincerely believe that this promise, I will visit upon you all your iniquities, is a blessing. And perhaps a good way of expressing that, consider God's covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Then in verse 13, there is a promise of horrific suffering. Know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and they will serve them, that nation, and they, that nation, will afflict them 400 years. Horrific suffering. In verse 16, and the fourth generation, they shall come back here to the land. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. Consider what that's saying. During that period of 400 years, Israel is suffering, afflicted, enslaved. And what's happening to the Amorite? They're prospering. And to the superficial eye, it looks like the Amorite is the beneficiary of God's blessing, and Israel is the beneficiary of God's rebuke, God's curse. But the chastisement of Israel chastens Israel and readies it to be worthy of God's blessings. The prosperity of the Amorite enables the Amorite to fill the designated level of iniquity whereupon there is nothing left of them other than utter extirpation, destruction, prosperity that leads nowhere, chastisement that leads ultimately to restoration. Now this, of course, is a cardinal principle in God's governance, and it's part, then, of, again, therefore, because I have known you of all the families of the earth, I will visit upon you all of your iniquities. But further amplifying this theme, consider the message. In Ezekiel, chapter 20, on the one hand, there are those of Israel who, after being exiled from the land of Israel to Babylon, conclude we will be as the nations, as the families of countries to serve wood and stone. God has severed his bond with us. Here we are in exile. We sever our bond with him. Let's forget about everything. And God responds in verse 33, As I live, says God the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out, will I be king over you. You aren't going anywhere. You're staying with me. Verse 34, And I will bring you out from the peoples, will gather you from out of the lands wherein you are scattered, with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm and with fury poured out. Terrifying. But through that terrifying verdict, there is a promise. A promise that ultimately, verse 40, in my holy mountain, in the mountain of the height of Israel, says God the Lord, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them, serve me in the land. They're returning. I will accept their offerings here when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries, the lands where you were scattered, and I will be sanctified in you in the sight of the nations because you come home. In verse 42, and you will know that I am God when I shall bring you into the land of Israel. 
into the land that I lifted up my hand to give unto your fathers. So indeed, there is the chastisement. There is the strong hand and outstretched arm and outpoured wrath, fury. But it is what rehabilitates you and what restores you to him. And considered in that vein, we appreciate that all the terrible devastations, specifically in the land, are in and of themselves, ironically, part of the promise. What provides us, as it were, with a guarantee of that ultimate return not only to the land, but most of all, through the land, to God in his palace. In Jeremiah chapter 31, in verse 20, the prophet addresses himself to the people on the brink, poised, about to be thrust into exile, set up waymarks, make guideposts, Set your heart toward the highway, the way by which you went. Return, O virgin of Israel, return to these your cities. You're going into exile. But pay attention to the route you're taking. Because it's two ways. Through that route, you went into exile. Through that route, you will return home. The exile itself is, as it were, the guarantee of the eventual return. In verse 22, thus says the God of hosts, the God of Israel, yet again shall they use this speech in the land of Judah and in the cities thereof, here in the land of Israel, when I shall return their captivity. God bless you, O habitation of righteousness, O mountain of holiness. And Judah and all the cities thereof will dwell therein together. The farmers and they that travel with flocks, the farmers and shepherds. For I have satiated the weary soul and every pining soul that I replenish. And the prophet interjects here upon this, I awake and beheld. And my sleep was sweet unto me. Because this is the ultimate promise. Verses 26 and 27, Behold, the days come, says God, that I will sow the house of Israel, the house of Judah, with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And it will come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to overthrow and to destroy and to afflict, precisely because of all this devastation, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, says God. You want a guarantee of the ultimate restoration? Ironically, look to the devastation. It is the guarantee of that ultimate restoration. And likewise, in Jeremiah chapter 32, the promise that while the land is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by the famine, by pestilence, In verse 37, Behold, I will gather them out of all the lands whither I have driven them in my anger and my fury and my great wrath. I will bring them back unto this place. I will cause them to dwell safely. And again, there is a spiritual promise. They will be my people. I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always for the good of them and of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And recalling that recurrent motif of all of your heart and all of your soul, there is one single solitary verse in all the Bible where God speaks of all of his heart and all of his soul. Here in Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 41, yea, I will rejoice over them and do them good and I will plant them in this land in truth with my whole heart and with my whole soul, 
For thus says God, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, the devastation, it is the guarantor, so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. And indeed, likewise, in Ezekiel chapter 36, we are on our final stretch here. In verse 33, in the day that I purify you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places will be built. And the land that was desolate will be worked, whereas it was a desolation in the sight of all that passed by. And they will say, these pastors by, this land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left round about you will know that I, God, have built the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I, God, have spoken it, and I will do it. And if we could maybe broaden the message here a bit further to recognize that, isn't it so, in so many domains of life, that what we see at least by our flesh and blood eyes around us, within our lives, is suffering, devastation, destruction, ruin. And it really is the basis, the promise, the guarantee of restoration. When we seize upon this as the opportunity to return home, to return to God, all of us. In whatever arena, Jew and non-Jew, God's hand is always extended. And the hand that smites is the hand that heals when we are prepared to take hold of it and return to him. And so it is that this message is not only a message for Israel. Because the homecoming to the land is not only Israel's. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 6. Also the aliens that join themselves to God, to minister unto him, to love the name of God, to be his servants. Verse 7, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable upon my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Verse 8 says, The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel, it's not only Israel, yet I will gather others to him besides those of him that are gathered. And of course, ultimately, this is a message that pertains to all the world. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, with this we conclude, it will come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of God's house will be established at the top of mountains and exalted above hills, and all the nations will stream to it. Because indeed, when we appreciate the message of reward, punishment, and exile, and restoration, restoration is ultimately universal. We all seize upon even the most devastating experiences, again, as the basis, as the promise as the guarantee of returning to God, of once again being the beneficiary of God's blessings. That maybe most of all is the emergent message from these chapters. May we indeed seize the opportunities even when they don't appear to us at first brush to be opportunities 
and return to him and his blessings. God bless you.